Excuse me. Now, we want to turn this morning, we're back up in the Old Testament, we're in the book of Deuteronomy, and we're in chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, please. And we're just going to read the two verses at the tail end of that chapter, verses 19 and 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 and 20. I've called my message this morning, The Necessities of the Will. We have looked over recent weeks, we're thinking about the days in which we live, we're looking at one or two things that we feel fortify us, that equip us to to, to live in these days, to live for our Lord Jesus Christ. We've looked a little at worship, we've looked over a week or two at the importance of the Word of God, the attack upon the Word of God, the power of the Word of God, and today we're thinking about the necessities of the will. And so two verses, Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days." that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give unto them. We're thinking about the will. The will. Deciding certain things with our will that are critical, and folks, let me say that again, that are critical to the world that we find ourselves living in in these days of time. In these verses that we've read together, God is speaking uh, to Israel, he's speaking about Israel and their future in the land which he has promised them, in the land which he has given to them. Verse 19, he says, I have set before you, that's opportunity, I have set before you, he says, life and death, blessing and cursing, and I am commanding you to choose life. It's an interesting thought that God would say, that sort of thing to them. Because obviously, if God has to say that to them, there is the possibility that they could go the other way. And friends, let me say something this morning. Life is continually about two ways, two choices, two desires, two voices, two masters, two kingdoms, two destinies, and many other twos as well. And the values that we adopt and the choices that we make is what sets the church of Jesus Christ apart from every single thing and every other person that's in the world around us. But with this comes consequences. We've got to understand that. Tremendous consequences. God says here, I have given you this promised land. I've given you this great opportunity. And friends, I am telling you today that you and I, just as they, will be held accountable for the consequences of our actions, just as God says they are going to be accountable for theirs in these verses. He says, if you choose life and you choose blessing, he says, you and your descendants are going to live in the blessing of those choices. That's what he tells them. However, If you choose poorly and you rebel against God, he says, you are choosing death. You are choosing cursing. And you and your children are going to be affected by the decisions that you make. There are consequences to all decisions that we have to make. Today, as a believer, you are on your way to heaven. Amen. 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 But friends, the question we have to ask ourselves today is, are we walking in blessing? Or listen, are we walking in cursing? Ah, you say to me, Jesus, that's not the way Jesus works. Is it not? Oh, it's great grace. Praise God for great grace. But that's how the Word of God lays it out before us. And so we've got to ask ourselves the question today, are we pursuing blessing as God exhorts us to do here, or are we living carelessly as the church at large does today? How are you living your individual life? And you see, the good news today is, of course, praise God, that God forgives us even for the wrong decisions 
and he forgives us for the wrong ways that we go. In Psalm 103, verse 11, he says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. We were listening to ministry on that psalm on Wednesday afternoon in the senior citizens. And he's talking there about those who fear him. The fear of the Lord is that he is everywhere and he knows everything. Can I let you into a secret? You can't keep a secret from God. Don't ever forget that. There's not a thing that you think, there's not a thing that you say, there's not a thing that you do that God is not completely aware of. He knows all about it. He is everywhere. He sees everything. And folks, listen to me. Even though the cross of Calvary stands and grace is available, God is a God of justice. Make no mistake about that. He's a God of justice. And you see, that means it always works out to the place where we get exactly what we deserve. That's what we get. And the only way we don't get what we deserve is whenever we repent. If we confess our sin, he is faithful, he is just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Where would we be if we didn't have that verse? What would we do if there wasn't grace that covers us in our stumbles and our failures and our fallings? Where would we be? And thank God his grace does cover that, but it covers what's confessed. And it covers what's repented of. And let me speak for a moment to any young people that are here. If you hold something in your life that you try to keep away from God, it will kill you. It will rob you. We've talked about how the devil works, how he chases the word in your life. And how every single day we're content and with that attack, that onslaught that comes from him. So it sins, it dies. And whenever you try to keep something away from God, your fellowship with him will die. We've looked at all of that in the previous week. Your joy will die. Your peace will die. And eventually, your spirit, your life will die as well. Because that's the way these things work. But whenever we confess our sin, praise God for his mercy. He forgives us. And the Bible assures us that never in eternity will those sins be reminded before us again. Verse 17 of Psalm 103 says, The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. Friends, he forgives. Are you glad about that? Praise God, he forgives. But you see, we still often have to face the consequences. The man died on the cross beside the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, remember me whenever you come into your kingdom. And Jesus speaks words to him and says to him, Today, you will be with me in paradise. And Jesus gives that man forgiveness. Jesus gives that man eternity with him. But you see, the Romans didn't forgive him. He still was being crucified and he would die. And friends, we're the same. Whenever we make wrong choices, whenever we go the wrong way, whenever we are careless in the things that we do, there are consequences that we have to face. And listen to me, please. The government doesn't always forgive us. And people around us don't always forgive us. And you know, if we are committed, if we have committed a crime, if we have done something wrong on somebody or whatever, you know, there can be lasting damage to relationships, sometimes even to health, and all kinds of things. Because consequences have got to be faced, and consequences have got to be lived with. Now here in Deuteronomy 30 and 19, the Lord shows that he's laying before them this decision, this choice. Choose, he says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you this opportunity, life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed 
may live. That verse also shows us that the things that we do can affect other people, even onto other generations. Oh, no, no, it doesn't work like that. Once we're saved, does it not? Oh, yes, things can be broken. Of course they can. But it can affect into all our generations. Let me say today, if you're a parent in this congregation, the way that you live your life will affect your children and will affect your grandchildren and probably affect your great-grandchildren too. The principles that you hold, the way you live in front of them, your relationship with them. You see, those things are passed on from generation to generation. The consequences of the choices that we make. Friends, everything has consequences. Everything. This nation, probably now for about 40 to 50 years, has been trying to see how much they can rebel against God and get away with it. And now, today, we are witnessing the consequences of that behavior all around us. We see morality collapse. We see that we've seen the financial system collapse. We see growingly society collapsing. We see hope for people in the nation collapsing. We just heard this morning, young girl, 20 years of age, overdose last night. Another statistic in the days in which we are living because things in the nation are collapsing all around us. And you see, friends, God can rebuild this nation. But if he does, if he does, he will do it from your heart and from my heart up. He will do it through the church. He will move amongst his own people. And he will do it by the church taking responsibility for their actions and for the days of which we live. Now, having said all of that, I want to mention three things today very, very quickly about the will. I don't often do that. I don't like to tell you how many things I'm going to mention because then if I'm too long in the first one, you're sitting there thinking, and he still has two more to go. I know the way it works. Don't worry. But I'll be quick. I'll be brief. Three things. Three things that need to be there in your will if you and I are to live in the blessing of God. And let me say something this morning. Each of these is completely opposite. Completely opposite to our culture. Completely opposite. If you are pursuing these three things, let me tell you that you will be in the vast minority of people in this nation living in this world. The first one is this, humility. We need to be people who are humble. And forgive me, you'll know these scriptures, but I'm going through them nonetheless. Because this is what the scriptures say. James chapter 4 speaks about pride. And in verse 6 of James chapter 4, he says, But he gives more grace. Wherefore, he said, God resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. That word resist, that word resist means to set yourself in battle formation against. That's what the root of that word means. To set yourself in battle formation against. To battle, to do battle with or to do battle against. God resists the proud. He resists the proud. Let me put it to you another way. Let me give it to you this way. God is totally committed to the failure of pride. And God is totally committed to the success of humility. He resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. 
If you are walking in pride, you may be experiencing problems. And you may be rebuking the devil. But it is probably very actually God who is resisting you, not the devil. Because God goes to battle against pride. He resists the proud. Listen, he will not let us succeed if we are walking in pride. But if we are walking in humility, praise God, he will give us all of the grace that we need in order to go through. And grace is everything that we need given to us freely. He will freely give us every blessing that we need to succeed. And so James in verse 11 there of chapter 4 says, Humble yourselves before God and he will lift you up. You know the account of the fall of the, of the devil, the fall of Satan. You find that back over, let me read you that, in Isaiah chapter 14. And it talks about, this is, folks listen, this is the original sin of the universe that Isaiah is going to speak about. The original sin of the universe. Because this is the first living being that we know of that rebelled against the authority of Almighty God. Isaiah 14 verse 12 says this. Let me read it to you. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I will be like the most high. He was the highest cherub. He was the worship leader in heaven. That's why your world today is so full of music. That's where all your, you know, your punk rock and your this rock and that rock and all the other sort of rock comes from. Because it's, it's inspired in the world by this fallen cherub that we call Lucifer or Satan. He was a worship leader in heaven. And listen, I thank God for music. But in the word it can be so perverted and twisted and some of the, the lyrics that are written to it are, are absolutely astounding. But music's an instrument that's used in the worship of God even around his throne in glory. And Satan, who had the privilege of occupying that high rank and the privilege of occupying that place at some stage in his arrogance, he says, I will be like God. I will set up my throne above the stars of God. And if you look at those verses, you can look at them on your own. This is Satan. I will, I will, I will, I will. That's what he says all the way through. And God said, in essence, I will not let that kind of arrogance and let that kind of pride go unnoticed or succeed. You have the same, the same thought that's given to us. The book of Ezekiel takes it up as well. Let me read one verse from Ezekiel chapter 28. It's verse 17. It's the same account. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And the verses go on even after that again. See, all pride says, I will. And all pride, in essence, says, I don't need God. That's a simple statement. I don't need God. But the depth and the consequences of that kind of thinking or that kind of statement is so deep and so profound. Listen to me, please. All pride says, I don't need God. And friends, listen. All sin, all sin originated in pride. That's where it came from. That was the first sin that's recorded for us. And God says, if you think you don't need me, I am committed to show you that you do need me. And I believe that's where the church is at today. In this nation. A parlous church. 
that doesn't see, by and large, everything that we should see. A church that's so far removed from the Acts of the Apostles. Folks, listen, if some of those creators that lived in the Acts of the Apostles were back today, there wouldn't even classes as the Church of Jesus Christ. And God's saying, I'm committed to show you that you can't do this without me. And God comes and God resists us. And listen, it's not a hateful thing. It's not something to destroy us. God in love comes to educate us and to draw us closer onto him. He talks about a broken, and he talks about a contrite spirit, a spirit that has been so crushed, a spirit that has been so broken, that that spirit and soul cries out to God, whatever you want, Lord. Tell me, have you ever been in that condition in your life? Have you? The biggest problem with most of God's people today is they've never been in that position. But that's what God's looking for. Complete humility, complete dependence upon him, upon him. And God's saying, I will convince you that you need me in your life. Friends, how we need him, don't we? Of course we do. Where's the salvation of souls? Where's the healing of bodies? Where's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit? And somehow we think we can do this stuff and just get on with it. We need him. We need him. There's a saying, a day without prayer is a boost against God. And you can always tell your level of humility by your level of prayer. Because whenever you don't pray, you are walking in pride. Because prayer, in essence, in actual fact, is acknowledging, I need you, Lord. I need God. Humility, that's the first one. Now you're wondering, how long is he going to be in number two? And how long is he going to be in number three? And I've got the roast in the oven. Or maybe it's chicken you're having today. Or maybe the spuds are in the slow cooker. And what will I do if he runs over time? How humility. The second thing that we need in our will is obedience. Obedience. If God is to bless us, then in our will, there has to be true submission unto him. Obedience. Listen, folks. Let me say this to you lovingly. You and I, we have no rights whatsoever in the kingdom of Almighty God. We live in a country that we class as a democracy. We have a vote that determines who governs. We had a vote over a year ago in determining will we stay in the EU or will we be out of it. Democracy. God's kingdom is not like that. You have no rights I have no rights. We all stand on a level playing field, by the way. Just because somebody occupies a position, just because somebody's called pastor for some reason, doesn't make me one bit different from you. And none of us have any rights of our own in the kingdom of Almighty God. We are servants, slaves, under a master. Now, I praise God today. He's a great master. Hallelujah. I thank him for that. But we don't have a vote. We don't have a right of our own. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. The kingdom of God is a theocracy. And he reigns supreme. What his word says goes. What his, his will is, is what has to be carried out. And you see, we get the kingdom of God so mixed up with what we're used to. And we are responsible in all ways, all of our ways, to be obedient to Almighty God in our lives. Listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, John chapter 5, verse 19. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For what things he does, those also does the Son likewise. 
In John 5, verse 30, Jesus says, I of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. In Luke chapter 22, we have our Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's about to die. And verse 41 of that chapter takes up the narrative. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he kneeled down and he prayed saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I don't know whether you've ever thought about it or not. I find it tremendously interesting that the original sin of the universe, when the universe became corrupted and the devil fell with so many of the angels, the corruption of the universe began with these words, I will. I will. And the redemption of the universe began with these words, not my will. Not my will. Every good thing in your life will begin with these words. Not my will, Father, but yours be done. Every bad thing that happens in your life and mine will begin with an attitude or words that say, I will. I will do this. I will do that without you. I won't do this. I won't do that. I'm setting my will in that direction. And I haven't even prayed about it. But that's the way I'm going to go anyway. That's when the bad stuff comes. We're talking here about obedience. You see, the will that's lifted up against the will of God, God will never, ever bless it. The half of the church in this country doesn't even believe in Pentecost. God help us. Is it any wonder? And all they've got to do is read the accounts of past revivals. God has never left himself without a Pentecostal witness right down through the years. Martin Luther spoke in tongues. And yet they'll tell us today, oh, they say, you know, you see, we can do it without all of that, Lord. That's too much off the cuff. That's not what we're used to. That's not prim and proper enough. I see nothing prim and proper in the Acts of the Apostles. I see a God of power who's moving in the Holy Spirit and the people of God chasing after him, trying to keep up with him. And all kinds of things are set loose. Hell set loose against him. And there's miracles, there's healings, there's salvation. You never read about them praying for one soul to be saved in the Acts of the Apostles. Because God was there with them just doing it. Friends, we're so far removed because we feel that we can do it our way and we don't have to really, really go the way of God. Can I ask you today, do you pray to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? Do you? Because I see nobody in Scripture that could do anything without it. But we take it or leave it. What odds? Look, that crowd, I speak in tongues. I wouldn't want to do that. Well, then you're resisting God, and he'll resist you. That's just, listen, that's not me. Take the word. That's the bottom line. His word. Are you walking in obedience to the word of God, or are you not? That's what this stuff's all about. See, the will has got to be surrendered. Whenever Satan lifted his will above God, Satan was cast to the ground. Whenever Jesus surrendered his will to Almighty God, Jesus was lifted to the highest position in the whole of the universe. Amen. Because God resists the proud, he gives grace to the humble. And so we've got to obey his word. And listen, that's a pattern for every person who walks in pride or who walks in submission and in obedience to Almighty God. And he taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And we put in the wee line, Lord, whenever I feel like it. 
whenever it doesn't cut across my will. But the real prayer is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And the very next line of that prayer, give us this day our daily bread. God says if you obey him, everything else that you need for life will come your way. We have proved that in our experience. Everything that you need, he will provide. He will provide. Humility, obedience, very quickly. Let me finish. Number three is thankfulness. Thankfulness. Friends, this is a huge one. Maybe you should have preached on this one first. Thankfulness. Think of this. The rebellion in the universe did not begin with beings or people who had been mistreated or who had been put down somehow. The devil occupied the highest position at the throne of God. Adam and Eve occupied the highest position in the creation of Almighty God. Perfect around God's throne. Perfect kingdom. Perfect garden that God had placed his creation in. None of them had been mistreated. None of them had been put down. And it all happened with beings and with people who just weren't thankful for what they had. They weren't thankful. Unthankfulness is the root of all rebellion. Those who crucified the Lord Jesus Christ had God among them, and many of them knew it. I don't think you can read the scripture and not see that. He was so radical, so different. But you see, he got up their nose. He wasn't of the establishment. And they crucified him. A remarkable scripture in Revelation chapter 20 says that after Jesus has reigned in the future to come, that even after that, the devil and the nations will still lead a rebellion against him, even after they've experienced his reign and total righteousness. It's amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. Jesus one day healed 10 lepers and only one of them came back to thank him. And that man fell down, it says, at Jesus' feet and he worshipped him and he thanked him. And Jesus looked at that man and Jesus says, I thought I healed 10 of you. Where's the other nine? One out of ten came back to thank him. I think of our church. I say this to you lovingly. We come on a Sunday morning to worship God. And three or four voices in this congregation lift their praise to him whenever opportunity is given. I sometimes wonder, does Jesus look down and say, where's the other 130? How often do you lift your voice to praise him and to be thankful to him? Oh, pastor, I'm thankful in my heart. We're all thankful in our hearts. But whenever we come together, we're to express, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. Oh, I could never do that. Pastor, I wouldn't even want to be like you. I wouldn't blame you. And I'm not wanting anybody to be like me, but I'm wanting you to praise the Lord because he's worthy. That's the difference. But we'll sit so uptight We'll sit so scared. I don't know what we're scared of, but somehow we seem to sit scared. And we don't engage with the Spirit of Almighty God whenever He comes to move amongst us. And we allow another opportunity just to pass by. Three or four people give thanks. And the rest do it so quietly in their hearts that nobody even knows whether they're giving thanks or not. And you're probably saying to me, what matter does that doesn't make any odds. It doesn't make a lot of odds. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. Enter his gates with praise. I rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. How do you rejoice? Do you ever wonder how you rejoice? Look, do you rejoice like this? If you saw me like this, would you say I was rejoicing? Would you? No, 
show, friends. You express your thanksgiving. You give to him in adoration and praise because of what he has given to you. You're thankful for what he has done in your life. And I know you're thankful. But we express that in the company. If you cannot confess Christ in the company of God's own people, you will never tell the lost about Christ out there. And we've got to learn to be able to do that and to worship him in the beauty of holiness and pour our hearts out before him in love and in adoration. You see, Jesus Christ, he cleansed me one day of spiritual leprosy. And if you're saved today, praise God, he cleansed you too. And he set you free from that. And he didn't do it that I would walk about thankless. And I might be a radical. I'm, I'm not a radical. In fact, I'm very, I'm, a, I'm very mainstream. I'm a, come on, be honest. I'm very mainstream. But friends, listen. He didn't do that for me, for me to sit on my mouth shut. And I don't intend ever to do that. While there's breath in my lungs, while there's strength in my body, I will praise him for what he has done. And you should do exactly the same. Because praise brings the victory. Bless his holy name. And if you're saved today, he has touched you just as he has touched me. And we should fall down in worship and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If we said nothing else, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. We'd be giving him the honor that's due his name. Amen. Where the whole realm, I quoted it this morning, that was why it came to mind. Where the whole realm of nature, mind, that's an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. I have to walk in obedience. I have to walk in humility. I have to walk in thankfulness because the Lord has done great things for me whereof I am glad. Glory to his holy name, even if you aren't. And that's where we stand at. Timothy 2 and 3 says, Know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men shall be, listen to this, lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, listen, unthankful and unholy. Unthankful. Unthankfulness, ungratefulness is a sign, it's a spirit of the end times of which we live. And the church has lost its desire and the church has lost its ability to give thanks to the one who gave us all upon the cross of Calvary for you and for me. And you see, we live in an infected world and we can give them what we have or we can allow them to invade us with what they have. And sadly, the church today has been invaded, folks, with the spirit of the age. And I'm not talking about the fashion. A lot of people think, oh, the church, you know, the words in the church because they wear this. Nothing to do with it. The spirit of the age is the attitude that we hold and the things that we don't do that the word of God says we should do. That's the spirit of the word that has invaded the church. But we're all caught up, you see. We're all caught up in our traditions. We're all caught up in our formality. We're all caught up in this stuff that stifles the spirit of God. And causes him not to be able, he could dare do no mighty work because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. Unthankfulness. Ungratefulness. Humility. I'm finished. Obedience. This was a thought just came to mind this morning at the table. Humility. Obedience. Thankfulness. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, he says, I know your works. He says, you're neither cold nor hot. He says, you're lukewarm. And he says, I'm going to resist you. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Hot. How do you become hot for God? In your will, you walk in humility. You walk in obedience. 
and you make an effort to walk in great thankfulness. That's hot living for Jesus. That's what hot is. But we're lukewarm. Some of us may be even cold. And Jesus says, you know, he said, I just wish you were one or the other. But I want you to be hot. Folks, don't you want to be hot? I want to be hot with all of my life. It's a passion of my soul to be hot for the one who laid down his all so that I could have the privilege of knowing him, walking with him, being led by him, being guided by him, having power over sin through him, and ultimately to be like him for all eternity. Isn't he worthy? Isn't he worthy? Father, Lord, we just thank you today for your word. Lord, we look at these things today, and Lord, the reason, the reason we look at these things, Lord, in connection with the will is because, Father, you know these things are so easily spoken. Lord, we can sing hymns that talk about our love for you and our praise for you, and we may never open our mouths, Lord, in praise without those words. No spontaneous praise or worship. Lord, we can sing about surrendering all. And maybe, Lord, in our hearts and lives, there's no humility, walking in pride, walking in disobedience. Touch our wills, Lord. Because we realize the real battle takes place in the mind. In the mind. Where the thoughts are nurtured, where the thoughts are birthed. Lord, where the will is formed and forged. And we pray, Lord, protect our minds and guide us. And move upon us by your Holy Spirit. Touch us afresh. Oh God, make us hot, we pray. Hot for you, for your Son, for the presence of your Spirit, and for the kingdom that you have birthed us into. We love you, we praise you. We commit every life to you. And we ask, Lord, bless your word to our hearts. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.